And Ron is going to come and begin to uh, speak to us, challenge us, give us some information on textual criticism. Specifically, he will begin to focus on some things related uh, to the majority text. So um, uh, do we have a – you're wired, okay? You're set. Good. Yes. We're going to start out with some confusion and announce that there are pages to be had up here. And it's first come, first serve, so knock the person down in front of you. Oh, Dan Ingram's going to get us organized. Well, it's good to be here. Last year was my first time at this conference. It's also good to see some uh, folks that I know. Uh, like many of you, I've been in the home uh, lodging with Jim Dumas over in Kiev. And also, to show you how much faith I have, uh, I actually, today, 15, 20 minutes ago, when they introduced themselves, the first time I've ever seen Ron Mondragon, and he has taught in our Bible college in, the, in Ukraine. But he comes with such high recommendations that uh, we already believed he was a great person, and it turned out to be that was true. So I would like for you to take your notes when you get those and open up right away these first the three lectures that I have here are kind of like a, le a introduction to textual criticism, and we will be focusing, uh, like he said, a little bit on the majority text, the difference of those things. Tomorrow, I also plan to take some time and talk about the, let me see, the guy saying my thing's not properly adjusted. Tomorrow, we're planning on taking some time to talk about the uh, debate between uh, Dan Wallace and Bart Ehrman that took place, and I'll try to give you a little bit of analysis of what I think happened in that debate. And also, uh, a few other things that uh, my boss, one kneeling right here in front of you, has told me that I <laughs> have to do. Okay? Every time I come up here, he says, okay, we're adding this to your agenda. If you have your notes, you can see that there, I look at the page number two in the table of contents, as it were, and you can see there are basically five parts. Uh, part number one will, uh, is kind of an introduction. It's very basic. I think most of you are above that level. And what we do there is we basically talk about why we believe the Bible. And what you will find in this world is that no matter how smart you are or how smart or advanced in uh, learning your professors are and your mentors are, there's always someone that can outdo them academically. And ultimately, the only reason I believe the Bible is not because of the wonderful proofs that we can have, although we will see some of those. But ultimately, we believe the Bible because one person, Jesus Christ the man, said that it's true. And every belief system on planet Earth is a circular reasoning system. That is, everybody who has a philosophical worldview or belief system has some reason they believe that. They have some document they go by. And they have some reason to believe that document is true. In our system, the Bible says it's true, and we claim, proclaim that it's true because the Bible says it's true, and therefore it's true what Jesus said is true. And I realize that is like reasoning in a circle, but like I said, every belief system has to have a base. And our faith is in Christ Jesus, and we believe what he said is true. And so no matter what you do, you cannot prove uh, absolutely that the Bible is the true word of God. But... We have, according to Simon P. Peter, even a more sure word than if you were an eyewitness, and that is the written word of God in our hands, and nowadays in our pockets, and in our computers, and everywhere else. So what I would like to do is uh, we'll skip that, and we're going to go. We may come back to that as time permits, and we'll show some images of how manuscripts were made, etc., etc. But on part two, we're going to talk about the ancient manuscripts, then part three, the text and translation philosophies, part four, English Bibles, how they were affected by... Uh, the textual criticism, and also, if we have time, which we probably won't get to, the theology of bibliology. So I'll go to page number one. Uh, this is a very basic chart, but I'll try to spend a little bit of time here because there are some... There are, Were there any more uh, I don't know. I think that's everything. Okay. Robbie, here's one more. We could make a rule that, you know, one per family or something like that, I suppose. Some of the people back here in the back didn't get... 
Raise your hand if you still need a copy. Okay, toward the back, still need a few. Today we're going to be covering some basic pages. Like we said, this is an introduction to uh, New Testament textual criticism. On occasion, we will mention the text of the Old Testament, but primarily we deal with the New Testament because of time's sake and the purpose that we're here. And so I'd like to start with page number three and talk about the New Testament manuscript production. <coughs> now, some people are surprised when they hold up their English Bible to realize that every English Bible you've ever seen in your entire life, uh, almost 100% is true, came from a printed Greek New Testament. Of course, we're talking about the New Testament here. Now, it is possible that there are a few people here who have seen a Wycliffe Bible, but not very likely an original Wycliffe Bible, which came from the Latin, not from Greek. But every Bible you have came from a printed Greek New Testament, and every printed Greek New Testament came from manuscripts. And the word manuscript from the Latin manuscripto, which just means handwritten. So when we say manuscript, we talk about the era, the first three quarters of the Christian era, the Christian movement, or about 15, 16, 1700 years uh, that was called the manuscript era. Then we have the printing era when the manuscript era was over. The printing press was invented approximately 1453. However, there were some islands in Greece and some places not far away where the monks and people who made copies of the Bible did not know there was a printing press a few hundred miles away. In fact, even in the next city, they wouldn't know for maybe a generation. And so the era of the, man the manuscript era goes beyond what we would have just in. Uh, just in the uh, before the printing press. It usually goes about 200 years later than that. So if you look at your page, you can see right away that we have five boxes here, and each box looks similar. Underneath each box is a little tiny box which tells the title of that box. We're going to talk about writing materials, writing instruments, writing style, uh, write, written document forms, and the kinds and number of New Testament manuscripts known today. Now, this information does change from time to time, especially the last one, because they're always uh, discovering new documents. Even in the last couple of years, some very, very important New Testament manuscripts have been uh, discovered. Uh, the very first thing we, we need to talk about, also, you see in each box, there's a little roll of little almost boxes. Those represent centuries. And the New Testament was written approximately the second half of the first century, probably around 45 to 95 to... That's why the first little box is a little shorter. And the first thing we look at is what Bibles were written on. Today, of course, all we know about is Bibles that are written on paper or done electronically or something of that nature. At first, the Bibles were all written on uh, papyrus. Matter of fact, we have, I actually have a piece of papyrus here which came from Egypt. I'm going to pass it around for show and tell. Maybe if we could have a volunteer come and get that and pass it around. Don't worry about damaging it. It's not a, this is not a 2,000-year-old piece. If it was, it would be worth about a million dollars because of the size it is with no writing on it. However, this one was, is the, what we would call tourist papyri. You can go there and they believe me, they're eager to sell a piece to you. You can buy a piece for about five bucks or cheaper. <laughs> okay. That was actually the Greek word papyrus is the basis of our English word paper. And uh, they had all kinds of, all grades of paper, of papyrus in those days. The very best grade was like what we would call imperial grade. You know, that's what the emperor would use. He would use the very best. Just like when you go down to Office Depot, you can find every grade of paper today. You could do the same thing in the Roman days. And the imperial grade of paper, was, of papyrus, was so good that it was basically like our modern-day paper. It's extremely good quality. Tomorrow, hopefully, I'll have some images up, and we're going to show some images of not only how they made that, but of some important papyri uh, documents. Now, you can see that the papyri documents of the New Testament came to be uh, written, and these are only documents that are what we call extant. I should mention that the word extant means known to exist. It does not mean in existence. There are about 5,600, I usually say 6,000 is the round number of, the, number of ancient Greek manuscripts of the New Testament that are known to exist today. That number is increasing. Occasionally it does decrease because uh, they decide that two particular manuscripts, or even three, or really just one. They do a little bit of renumbering system, and it goes, the number goes down. Recently has gone up quite a bit as new manuscripts have been found. But if you look at your little chart, you can see that these manuscripts date from about the 2nd century to approximately the 8th century. At the beginning, of course, the New Testament era, most everything was written on papyrus manuscripts. 
uh, and the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament, even to this very day, are on papyri. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages of everything that we have in this world, and that has to do also with the Bible text. The big disadvantage of papyrus manuscripts is that they were uh, not durable. They didn't last very long. Uh, the advantage is that they were very cheap because they're made out of a plant which grew naturally in, along the uh, Nile River, and uh, they were very abundant, and papyrus could be made in large quantities and was quite cheap. But for every plant, you need air, you need oxygen, you need air, you need light, and you need water. But if you go out here, well, in Houston, you can go out almost any day and find a green leaf. But in Ukraine, if you go out those two months when there's a green leaf, you can find a green leaf and you can pluck it up. And if it is after it's plucked, if it is exposed to air or to light or to water, it will deteriorate. So the same thing it grows is the same thing that destroys it. As a result of that, as far as we know, every one of the papyrus manuscripts of the New Testament today was discovered in the sands of ancient Egypt, where there is almost no water, and under the sand there's almost no sunlight and almost no air. And they deteriorate some, but most of them were, as far as we know, were found there. Some of them weren't actually, they were bought down in Egypt, and et cetera, et cetera, but almost everybody agrees that they ultimately were found there because that's the only place on the planet where they are very, very well preserved. Now, uh, the second thing they wrote on is what we call vellum or parchment. You'll see those titles. I put them there because these are the kind of titles that you will see in textual criticism uh, and advanced commentaries. Uh, these are basically animal skins. They use, they use antelope, they use calf, they use goat, they use cow. Uh, today, these words, uh, vellum and, and parchment, are all pretty much used interchangeably. In the past, they actually, it depends on which kind of vellum you're talking about, they use them a little bit differently. Today, they basically just mean animal skins. As you can see, there was a very large number of manuscripts written on that, uh, in that uh, particular medium. The big advantage is that they, this stuff could be scraped very thin. You'd be shocked at how good a quality they could make these papers, and they're very smooth. Papyrus, papyrus leaves or manuscripts were made with strips like this and then like this. They were not interweaving like a basket. And it was very easy to write one way, but when you write on the back side, and almost all manuscripts have been written on both sides, when you write on the back side about every inch, you hit a little bump because the sheet that's coming down that way. But with animal skins, you don't have that. It's very, very smooth, both sides whitened and extremely good. Uh, and they last a long time, so there's big advantages. Of course, the disadvantage is the cost, because these don't grow out on the Nile River, okay? The oldest Bible in the world is, uh, man is uh, Manuscript Sinaiticus, with having the Old and New Testament. Uh, and it's not complete, but almost. But that particular Bible took about 360 cows to produce. And that, my friend, is lots of money. And so these kind of manuscripts especially happened after, though not exclusively, primarily after uh, Christianity was a re legal religion and the church began to have some money and they began to produce stuff like this. And don't put this on the recording, but I've heard that there was about 50,000 pounds of hamburger meat left over. Next day they invented McDonald's and that's how they funded this thing. <laughs> so if Robbie Dean would get a little more innovative, he could, you know, fund this a little bit better. Well, it wasn't until about the 9th century that paper, as we think of it, was invented. It took a while, as you can see, the little chart kind of gradually shows that. And as paper began to be used more and more, became more widely available, that gave the documents began to be written on that. Now, the next thing we want to talk about real briefly is writing instruments. For the first couple of centuries of Christianity, every... Uh, New Testament manuscript was written with a stick, or a, a, what we would call a reed. Uh, if we have time tomorrow, we'll show some images of these as well. But basically what you do is you have a sharp stick, a little round stick, you pull it apart of, of a plant. Sometimes even, you know, if you dry them, they even have a little hole in them for ink to go in. You sharpen them up very sharp, and uh, you stick them in the ink well, and you can write letters with them. Now, there's advantages and disadvantages to these as well, as you might expect. Everything has those. Uh, the disadvantage, well, the advantage of them is they're cheap. They're just a plant growing out there, and you can plug as many as you want. And uh, they work quite well, they're, so there are advantages. It's easy to sharpen them up. Uh, one big disadvantage, actually, there's two disadvantages. One is that they don't hold much ink. Almost no ink goes in that little tube. If it does, it's soaked up by the uh, fibers of the wood. And if you have any sharp piece of wood, like if you take a toothpick and you stick it into liquid and write with it, and you do that 100 times, 200 times, it doesn't take long where the 
the point, the sharp point of that piece of wood is soft, and it begins to write very poorly. Uh, at, on some manuscripts that are, you can see this very well, I'll try to show you a manuscript uh, tomorrow of the Decian persecution about A.D. 251, where uh, uh, a Roman official by the name of Hermes, he signed his name on there, on this document where under the Decian persecution, they wanted Christianity and other religions to be outlawed, only Roman religions, and every family in the Roman Empire had to sign a document, and the official said, this person signed it, we're the witness, they bowed down to the Roman God, they worshipped Roman gods, they bowed down to his royal majesty and sovereign Lord God, Decius, or whoever the emperor was in that time. They didn't care what you believed, as long as you stamp, stamped your document. But the purpose of showing that is it shows very clearly on this particular document that you could stick, they could stick their stylus in the ink and write, and it would be very black ink, but in about two words, it would, be, it would gradually fade away to almost nothing. Then they'd stick it in again, it'd be black, and it would gradually fade away to nothing. So the, the quill pen has a big, I mean, the uh, reed pen has a big disadvantage. One, it doesn't do much, and it also gets, you have to sharpen a lot because of the, the pen, uh, the sharp point gets worn out quickly. Now, uh, probably most people here saw the beginning and the ending of the movie uh, Forrest Gump, because this is an academic conference. So, <laughs> some, I forget that. And at the beginning end, this feather comes floating down. Well, what happened, they began to realize that Jesus made ducks waterproof. And so when you pluck one of these feathers off and use that to a quill pen, guess what? You can sharpen that pen up and stick it in ink a million times, and it doesn't get soft, because they're made for liquid, okay? And pens are hollow, and so they can suck some ink up in that tube, and you can write a long time, because if it's cut just right, the ink will come out perfectly, and you have a great ink pen. And really not much different from the fountain pens that we had when I was a kid. Now, the, uh, as you can see on your chart, from about the 4th century and 5th century, uh, every manuscript that we know was written by a feather. In fact, almost all the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, I would say, in all honesty, probably 98% of everyone known, that's kind of a guess, was written by a feather. It was a big, big improvement. Probably not as cheap because you had to have some bird that would sacrifice for you. But, hey, it worked. Now, the third box, the writing style. Uh, at first, the first half of the Christian era, they uh, wrote in what we would call an unseal style. It was a kind of a uh, capital letter, boxy type image. Not quite like that, but somewhat like that. Actually, the Latin unseal kind of means inch high. These weren't really inch high, but it's kind of like a capital. In the 8th, 9th, 10th centuries, the Greek language did go under uh, an evolutionary process, you might say, to uh, transform into a minuscule style. Now, this is, there are minuscule and synonym with the word cursive, but they're not the same. Most synonyms have differences. Actually, the cursive was a type of writing that was known in, in Greek even before Jesus and the apostles were born. But uh, minuscule is a particular style that these scribes would use, uh, not quite the same as ideas cursive, but they were still a running small letter. There were big advantages when they switched from minuscule, um, from unseal to minuscule. And the big advantages were two things. They wrote smaller, not always, but as a general rule, smaller. And that would, let's say if it's 30% less space, that's 30% less uh, document, paper, papyrus, whatever you're writing on. In this case, it would be uh, leather or paper. Uh, it was cheaper because you don't have to buy a thirty, you know, thirty percent less. Also, it was faster because if you if you do like uh, writing or printing or cursive, I think today they call it writing and cursive. When I was a kid, it was called printing and writing. So they, today, I think it's called cursive if you do it quickly in English. Well, you can do that a, for the most part. Most people can do that a lot faster. So they can make a Bible, let's say, one third cheaper than and one-third faster by this style of writing, and it, that was the, the style that was used in the second half of the Christian era. And also, I would say approximately 90% of all ancient manuscripts known of the Bible, of the New Testament, are in this style. Unfortunately, the unseals for us, or people like myself, are much easier to read, and the manuscripts are kind of like, some of them are kind of like, you know, when you go to the doctor, I don't know if they still do this, in the USA, and they write a prescription. No one can read it except for the pharmacist. You ever dip, been that? It's kind of like that style of writing. They stick it on there, and you say, what did he say? Okay, so that was basically the writing style. Every time it seemed like there was a change, it was always for the better uh, natural 
thing, that, but God used it in the providence of time for uh, the Christian movement. Now, the next box is the written document forms. And basically, there's two forms, the roll, or what we sometimes would call a scroll, and the codex, which is sometimes what we might call a book. Now, the New Testament documents are almost all on uh, codex. Only four out of, the, as far as I know, only four out of the, when I say 6,000, there aren't that many, but it's the roundest thousand. Okay, there's over 5,600, but we don't know exactly how many because, like I say, the chip number is kind of fluid. But only four that I'm aware of are actually written on a roll. Those are very rare. In fact, in the first several centuries of Christianity, about uh, 90 or percent or higher percent of all the documents that we know of were written on codex. At the same time, that same percentage of Greek documents by, that were what we call like secular or literary documents or government documents, 90 percent of those were written on rolls. And scholars pretty much agree that Christians did not invent the codex, but they did make it popular, they did perfect it, and the purpose was for evangelism, church planting and teaching the Bible in other towns, other communities, or other churches in the same, other house churches in the same area, because it was extremely difficult to take a roll and do anything with it. But it was very easy to take a couple of sheets and do something with it, or a little, a little book. You can illustrate this like this. Let's pretend like everybody here is a rabbi, and you all have a roll. So take a roll, put your hands like this, like you have a scroll in each one. Now, Let's pretend like I'm uh, a rabbi and I'm teaching in Genesis and it says, not good for a man to be, live alone. Keep, keep your roll up here. And I said, but Jesus also quoted this in Matthew. And so let's turn over there. And everybody go like this. <laughs> That's where they invented carpal tunnel syndrome. <laughs> okay. So you can see a codex is a big, big advantage. If you hold just about any book, I'm not sure whose Bible this is. Man, it's brand deluxe, but I can guarantee you that. But if you hold up about any book, you can see... Th- a book basically is a codex. At the bottom here you can see they're made out of choirs. Each choir is maybe 15, 20, 30 pages. They fold it in half, sew that together, and that's a choir. They take 20 or 30 of those, fold, put them together, and make the codex. Strange as it may seem, there are some important manuscripts of the New Testament which are pretty big that the whole thing was only one giant choir, but that's not the uh, normal situation. By the way, uh, in this class we also talk about, I'm not sure if we'll get to it in these three sessions, but in our textual criticism class, we talk about these um, a number of manuscripts there are, and especially when we get to uh, like pages, it may be shocking to you to know that of these almost 6,000 uh, pages of the New Testament, I mean 6,000 manuscripts, many of them are very, very long. Generally, they're later, but not all of them are later. Some of the earlier ones are very long. And if you count the number of pages, half pages or whatever, just fragment or piece, anything that's a piece of a page, there are two and a half million pages. That is just almost mind-blowing when you consider, because the average, the average manuscript, this is also shocking to people too, is like 400 and something pages long. Now, a lot of the very important manuscripts are just a, one fragment of one a page or two pages. So there's a big, big uh, job ahead of us. There's a lot of stuff to look at. Now, the last box is a little more complicated. It's the kinds and number of New Testament manuscripts known today. Uh, the usually we we you know we list these type of four the papyrus uncial lectionary and minuscule the little solid double lines indicates the centuries that the manuscripts we know of uh, are extant for example papyrus manuscripts uh, are known to be from the second century to the eighth century now there could be some discovered later on that goes to the ninth century whatever those are the ones we have today the little numbers Beside that, tell approximately how many there are. In fact, you can make a correction on yours because these notes were printed uh, or written about a few months ago. <laughs> Actually, in the last couple of years, there have been a number of manuscripts, so you could change that 115 from papyrus to 128. So that number has been growing. In fact, even in the last uh, 30 years, about uh, 30 of these manuscripts were discovered. I can still remember a dozen years ago or so when they discovered papyrus number 115, which is part of the book of Revelation. And uh, it's many ancient manuscripts, the beginning pages and the last pages were the first ones to fall away and get lost because you can see how that would happen. Uh, And the two most important manuscripts of the book of Revelation, papyrus 115 and papyrus 47, uh, are both have kind of like the middle section. 
And the interesting thing is that uh, in this one, which is very old, in fact, in that debate they said it was the oldest, but I was almost absolutely certain that P-47 was older than that one, but I'll have to check on that. But anyway, certainly one of the oldest copies of the book of Revelation. In the middle of that book, it says the number of the beast is 616, not 666. Okay, and, and actually there's some early church fathers that had already known, they said some manuscripts do have 616, not 666. However, about every scholar that I know of still agrees because of the massive amount of evidence that states otherwise that the number 666 is still the best number. So do not go home and throw away all your prophecy sermons. <laughs> okay, keep those. They still work. All right. Uh, then, uh, so papyrus, there's about 128. Then unsealed, there's almost 300 of those. Uh, and you can see they date from the 3rd century to about the 11th century. Now, the, the difference in those is one's on papyrus. They're both capital letters. They're both uh, this unsealed style. But unseals are all made on leather and, the, uh, and the, uh, maybe a few of the paper at the end. And the papyri are all made on papyrus plants. And those, the unsealed are very valuable because not only they're early, but they're Many of those are quite long. Unfortunately, the vast majority of those 128 papyri, uh, less than 100, I mean, less than the 28 of them. In other words, more than 100 of them are just fragments. In other words, one page. Maybe a few of them are two pages. But there's only a dozen or so that are really lengthy and very, very valuable. And those are the most important ones. And we'll talk about those in our uh, textual class. Now, the lectionary manuscripts are quite different. You can see there's 2,400 of those from the 4th century all the way until the end of the manuscript period. And they're valuable for a couple reasons. The most important value of the lectionary uh, manuscripts is that the Greek-speaking Orthodox Church produced most of those, what would become the Orthodox Church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox split in the year 1054. But basically they continued, those people who wrote Greek manuscripts, they were extremely conservative when it comes to their text. They did not change the text. And they would rather take a bullet in the head than change the text because that was their religion. You know, their religion is you do this, you don't change this. You know, this is all these people, these monks' pictures are on the walls of the Orthodox Church. If you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. They wrote this, you don't change it. Well, to scholars, that is very important because when you have one that was written 4th, 5th, 6th century A.D. and one that was written in the 14th century A.D., a thousand years apart, you can look and say, wow, they're almost copies of each other. They're very close. And that becomes important because, as scholars like Metzger and them used to point out, the, the fact that they didn't change shows the consistency of that text, and it helps us to get the idea of what the text has been throughout the hit transmission of the, of the textual period. And in textual criticism, the history of the text, or the history of the transmission, the copying, and even the printing of the Greek New Testament is very important because it shows uh, to a degree, and even more when the printing press was invented, it shows in, from the 1500s on, when they printed the Greek New Testament, it shows the textual philosophy of the, of the scholars of that time, what text they believe was best and why they did that. And so the printing, the printing history and the handwritten history of text, textual criticism, in other words, the New Testament text, or what we call the transmissional history, is just as important as the manuscripts themselves. Because we can look at the manuscripts, but it's very important to see why people copied to a degree at least what they copied. The last type of, man, of, of uh, manuscripts are the minuscule manuscripts. And you can see these date from approximately the 9th century uh, to the end of the manuscript era, and there are approximately 3,000 of those. Now, in a moment, we're going to talk about text types, text families, and the lectionary manuscripts. Keep this in mind. There's a lot of those minuscules. There's a lot of those. As far as I know, all of the lectionary manuscripts are what we would call the Byzantine text type, and almost all of the uh, unseals are the Byzantine text type. Now, on, are there any questions on that? <clears throat> By the way, when we go through this, if you have a question, I'm going to try to go pretty fast because we are limited on time. Uh, but if you have a question, be sure and ask that if you really have a good question because what will happen, that means probably there's something I omitted or didn't communicate properly. If you have a question, then feel free to ask that. If I don't know the answer, I usually just say, well, we're going to talk about that later, <laughs> which is my normal answer. <laughs> If you don't believe me, you can ask my students in Ukraine. That's what they always say. Every time they ask a question, I just say, 
uh, Christology. They know they have to wait for the next class. <laughs> okay, page four is like an apologetic uh, type of page. Uh, these notes are a part, uh, designed partly as an introduction to our textual criticism class. And also I've, I've used these uh, a little bit more than this. Your, I think yours has 33 pages or something. I have a little 36-page document thing I put together and I do seminar, seminars and churches and stuff on this. And I've even done it for NASA, by the way. But uh, uh, you, usually, this I didn't used to put these in there. I've done about 50 of these seminars, and I didn't put this in there for a while, but people kept asking about this. And I found out when I put this, they really like this because it kind of shows an apologetic effect of pages of the, this page for the Christian faith. And basically what it, what it does is it takes most, not all by any means, of the uh, ancient literary documents in Latin and Greek uh, that would be somewhat around the New Testament era, and compares them as far as their preservation to the New Testament. And you can see on the left column is the author, the right column is the uh, title or the kind of writing we have, history, tra tragedy, science, political, all that. Now, when I was in college, I majored in Greek, and I, have, I remember having to read some of this stuff. It was an absolute nightmare at that time to do that. And I couldn't do it today, probably, because it's... This stuff is not easy. And also, the third column is the proximate date. Usually we date by the guy's life. It's, if he was alive, then he had to write in that period. And the fourth column is the oldest known copy in the world that we have of his writings. Now, this kind of information is found from a number of sources. I did have uh, two, uh, actually more than two, but at least two master students who worked for me that did a lot of research to try to improve this. And I'm telling you, some of this information is not easy to come by. <laughs> it's just hard to find. I mean, I wrote, we wrote to dozens of classical scholars in the universities, and, and the information is available. It's just trying to find the source because not everybody talks about this kind of stuff. But uh, from all your textual criticism books, pigs together here and there, and you'll see uh, that they pretty much all agree with what we have here. Now, the next to the last column is perhaps the most important because it's the span of years from when the guy, from when the document was written to the oldest copy that we have, in other words, the closest copy to, to the document. And if you just glance through here, most of the things that were, most of the ancient documents that we have, uh, the oldest copy we have of that document is a thousand years removed on average. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, it's about a thousand years. And a lot of the stuff in the old days was written on papyrus plants, which usually would maybe last five years if it's used much at all. And that means after five years, somebody's got to recopy it. Well, when you recopy it, guess what? You're going to introduce new mistakes. You might even accidentally correct a few old mistakes or even intentionally correct a few. You might even think that you're correcting a few mistakes and introduce some new mistakes. But the, for sure, you're going, to, you're going to introduce new mistakes. And you do that over and over and over and over again. New people, different people. Some are not, that's not even their main language. You just hire them. Say, yeah, I know the alphabet. I can copy anything for money. And so what happens, these documents, like you take, let's take a look at the fifth one, Thucydides. You can see it was written about 400 B.C., and it was 900 A.D., the first known copy. And that's not the whole copy, by the way. That's 1,300 years after it was written. And it went through so many, so many copies and copies and copies and copies through that generation. We don't know how many, of course. Had to be many. Uh, that scholars today pretty much admit we don't know what the guy said. I mean, it's just a, it's a big guess. We know he did write about the history of you know, Sparta and Athens, yes. That, that much we can say for sure. And we also know if you've translated any Thucydides, any Thucydides that he, like Joseph, was a liar because he wasn't that smart as he claimed he was. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, then, and then look at the no, total number of co copies in his, it's eight. And those are all uh, only fragmentary. Some of them have more than others, of course. Now, if you go down to compare it at the fifth from the bottom, you have eight or nine men that wrote the New Testament and from approximately 40 to 95. And the oldest document is approximately 120, give or take, you know, like I say, a generation, because none of these documents are dated exactly. And that's only about 25 years removed from when it was originally written, like uh, John's Gos John, the Gospel of John written in perhaps 90 A.D. in Ephesus. And... 30 years later, it was found in the sand, of, or at least a copy was in the sand of Egypt, which means it had to travel a long ways, which means it had to have distribution, which means people were making copies. 
and only one generation removed from this part of it, small part of John 18, yes, but still it is a part. By the way, there also has been uh, recently some manuscripts found in the New Testament, and one of them, at least maybe more than one, they're claiming now for the first century. So papyrus number 52 may not be the oldest copy uh, of the New Testament soon. In fact, Dan Wallace is pretty clear that it is from the first century, but the, what we have to do is wait for a couple years to where more paleographers have to examine it and give their opinion of it. One, yes, one paleographer says first century, which if is the case, then it would be a very remarkable find for New Testament studies. And look at the number of copies. If you go to the right side, most of them are only a few, a few exceptions, but in the New Testament, 6,000. And that is only, of course, that's a rounded number, but that is only Greek copies, in other words, original language copies. And if we added ancient translations like the Latin, Syriac, etc., uh, it would be well over 20,000, 20 to 25,000. Actually, no one knows how many ancient copies there are. We don't even know for sure how many copies of the Latin Vulgate there are. We do know that there's more than 10,000, but no one's ever tried to figure out where they all are. They're everywhere. Any question on this page? I realize that I should slow down. <laughs> Dan is looking at me like I'm talking too fast. It's because I married a girl from Rhode Island. Man, they talk fast up there. <laughs> okay. Now, the next two pages we cover just real briefly because we've all covered this usually in bibliology, but it is important in this class because in textual criticism, as far as my level of it, and over the class we teach for Chafer Seminary, is not an advanced textual criticism class. It's a basic textual criticism class, and we do not do textual criticism of the apocryphal books. Some people do that, <laughs> believe it or not. In this debate, which I'll talk about tomorrow between Bart Ehrman and Dan Wallace, they, they actually do talk about the Gospel of Thomas and a few things like that, which is not an apocryphal book, but it is uh, a pseudepigraphal New Testament type book. Now, what we do here is we ask, how was it determined which book should go into the Bible? And like I said, this is not a class for New Testament or for Old Testament, but there really wasn't a whole lot of big debate over the canon of the Old Testament. I know there's some evidence that, uh, you know, that there was a, in AD of 95 or so, there was a conference held. That may or may not have happened. No one knows for sure. But uh, as far as we can tell, the, the list of books of the Old Testament was pretty well settled many, many years ago, way before even the New Testament time. And Josephus and the New Testament people pretty much, pretty much agree with that. But the New Testament wasn't so. Because when the New Testament books were written, they were written to individual churches, whereas the Hebrew Bible was not written to a particular church or a particular person, uh, like Timothy or someone. But they were just God's books, you might say. And uh, they weren't sent just to one location. So I can imagine that, uh, let's say in A.D. Uh, 60, Paul writes a letter to the city of Philippi, uh, or close to that. And and probably cities like Ephesus, Philippi, Corinth, Rome, uh, these cities probably had not one, but even 200 or more house churches. Every church was a house church in those days, and there were dozens and dozens, hundreds of them. And when he wrote those letters, uh, they would get this, and they'd say, wow, this is ser serious business, and we got a letter from Paul. It's very important. And they said, make copies, because every church needs this, and they began to make copies as fast as they can make copies. Fortune is not a very big book, so they could copy, copy, copy. As soon as they got one copy, they'd say, make a copy of that and take it to the next door or whatever, spread it around. And pretty soon you'd have copies of copies and copies of copies of copies and copies of the original would keep being made as well. And probably what happened is every time someone made a copy, they introduced a mistake. Because it's very easy to make a mistake when you're copying. Now, if we had time, I would just I would tell you to take that piece of paper in your hand and take a blank page and copy it exactly as close as you can on the page beside Then we'd take them all up and we'd see that there's a lot of mistakes. <laughs> okay, Human beings make mistakes. It is true that God promised that uh, in the, the doctrine of inspiration that every, every word, every letter, every jot, tittle that was directly inspired by the Holy Spirit could not be flawed. It cannot be improved upon. But he never promised that copiers, engravers, printers, you know, professors, preachers, <laughs> All those people are going to be fallible. In fact, none of them were. So, uh, what happened in the New Testament and they began to collect these books, uh, they were glad if they had a copy of, they were glad if they had a copy of uh, Philippians. And he would write to the Ephesus church and churches, and they'd multiply, and he said, by the way, there's some at Laodicea, I want you to get those, send yours over there, and they'd make more copies. 
And pretty soon they'd even have collections. They'd say, wow, we have all Paul's epistles, or at least what they would think would be all of them. And it's true in manuscript P46, dates approximately A.D. 200, not really that far removed from Paul, maybe 140 years, 130 years. Uh, there's a whole collection of Paul's epistles. So, a hundred years after the New Testament was written, some people did have collections of the Gospels, Paul's epistles, general epistles, whatever. But no church council or no decree or no group, no denomination, no official said, look, here are the 27 books of the New Testament. These and no more. No one did that. I like how F.F. F. Bruce explained it. He said, you have to put the Holy Spirit in there because he's the only one that could have done this. But what happened is churches began to spread and they began to need more copies and new books would come in. You know, next week at the Bible study, some teenager says, hey, I got a brand new book here, Gospel of Simon Peter and or a book, the Revelation of Simon Peter or whatever. And there are books like that. And they'd say, well, we never heard of that before. And they'd look at it and they'd say, hmm, bad doctrine in this book. So what happened is over time, they came up with three criteria, and no one came up with it and said, use this. It just happened this way. But they had three criteria that they used, and you can see it here. One is apostolic authority. In other words, it had to be written by an apostle or his representative. And if it wasn't, then automatically it was suspect and, and probably not going to be making it into the canon. Another one was tradition. If you brought a new book and no one had ever seen this before, they said, well, we've never heard of a church that ever used this book before. And, uh, but if it had been used 100 years, and people said, yeah, my grandfather had this. We all know that this has been used in all the churches for years and years and years and years. Then that book is likely to get in there, but the, other, the one that hasn't been used was not likely. Doctrine. Doctrine was very important. They have to have sound doctrine. They used the doctrine of the apostles that was accepted as the norm or the standard. And if it didn't teach that doctrine, then out it goes. So it was a complicated process, uh, and yet it was not a process. But we have to believe, I have to believe, that the Holy Spirit knew what he was doing, and in the providence of God, this thing worked out. Now, today, believe me, there are, you know, there's like 700-page high-quality scholarly books you can get just on the canon. I mean, you can, I call them printed ether. But some of you get that a little later. If you're reading a 700-page book on the canon, I guarantee you that's bedtime reading. <laughs> but on the next page, we have four early, uh, four early canons, if you will. And these, uh, Marcion, the Muratorian canon, the Eusebius canon, Athanasius canon. Even as early as 140, this guy, it's, today we know him as a heretic. Uh, he has a, a list, at least he mentions a list of New Testament books, which are about 50% of what we have. And then the Muratorian canon, about A.D. 200, just a century after it was finished, has almost the same list of what we have, especially deficient in some of the general epistles. Eusebius, about 325, he's the ecclesiastical history type guy. He has almost the same list. And finally, in about 367 A.D., a pastor by the name of Athanasius wrote a letter at Easter time, and he mentioned the 27 books that we have. And so that date is the oldest date that we have documented for this list. I'm sure it's probably not the oldest. I'm sure that the churches, many of them use the same 27 books and no more, even before that time. But that's the oldest documentary proof that we have that uh, the canon uh, was used there. And pretty much uh, it's been accepted. Today, of course, there are some churches who accept apocryphal books. They were never in the Hebrew text, but they were. Some of them were in the Septuagint text, and also, which is the early translation of the Hebrew, and also in the Latin Vulgate text, which was made around A.D. 400. Okay, any questions on that? A lot of theologians that could cover that probably better than I could. Now, page number seven. There are ten definitions that we have to have. If you want to know anything about this subject, these are absolutely essential. Because in this particular, uh, in this particular introduction, uh, Pastor Dean has decreed that I talk about the majority text quite a bit. And to do that, we have to have these ten definitions. I mean, it's not exactly right, but these are so, so very basic. Now, in our textual criticism class, one of the very first pages of the notes is like we give them about, about 70 or 80 definitions. And I say, first thing I say at the bottom of all those definitions is, 
These will be on the first test. <laughs> so there are a lot, there's a lot of terminology and texture criticism. And uh, matter of fact, I even began writing a book on that. It's already 100 pages just on textual criticism and translation terms. And I'm thinking, man, when I started out, I thought it'd begin 10 pages. So let's take a look at just these. And you have to make sure you fully understand. It's just like I should mention that if you, on page three, when we talk that chart, you have to be able to think through this chart and have no question on you understand everything on there. If you do that, by the way, you're already ahead of 90% of all people in the United States on the text of the New Testament, how it was, how it was over the his history, okay? If you can just look at that page. On this page, it's very basic. I know this, and some of you people are going to say, why is he covering this first grade stuff? But to some people, it's also uh, like uh, Syriac language or something. I can't say Greek to me because half of you people are Greek scholars. Now, the first one is the word manuscript, which I've already hinted from the Latin manuscripto, which means uh, a handwritten document. Usually, biblical studies refers to an ancient copy of a portion of the Bible, especially for our class. We're primarily interested in the New Testament. And there are, like we said, 5,600, almost 6,000 copies of uh, the New Testament, some fragment or some complete. Actually, about 60 or 10 percent. Let me say 1 percent. Yeah, 1 percent, uh, a little more than 1 percent are the entire New Testament. All the rest of them are portions. Now, the next word is text type, also text family. Uh, this is not so easy to, uh, easy to distinguish. In fact, if, uh, I don't know where Robbie or whoever is one of these people that's controlling this gizmo, but if we could throw up a map of the Mediterranean Sea, it'd be nice right now. <laughs> I mean, I, maybe that's possible. I don't know. The other day when I was up here teaching, their stuff was going up there all the time. I said, what is this? Robbie gets his hand on his new computer and his new laptop and no his new iPad I guess they call it. Okay. That's right. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. Uh, a text type or text family is a pattern of similar readings. The hypothetical text that stands behind manuscripts that are similar uh, is a text type, text family. We might call it the archetype. There's even other other stranger names than that for it. Now, these names, the names of text types or text families, there's basically four, uh, the Alexandrian, the Caesarean, the Byzantine, the Western. And we're going to talk about those in another page, just in a few minutes. In fact, the next page, we're going to talk about it even more. But I want to show you real briefly at first uh, where they uh, deal with. Now, if you look at first, they're basically, think of down in Egypt, and then about basically in Israel, what we call the Caesarean from the town of Caesarea. And then think of ancient Greece and ancient well, modern-day Greece and modern-day Turkey, ancient uh, Asia Minor, those would be called the Byzantine. And then off of this map over here somewhere on the wall would be, oh, there it comes over this way, over to the city of Rome. You can see where, this must be where Paul went. And see, you can see the city of Rome in Italy, and even further south in North Africa, those in Carthage, those are considered the uh, west. Okay. Now, let's see. Oh, we only got three minutes left. Is that right? What time is my session over with? We've got a few minutes for Q&A. Oh, okay. Man, we're almost finished. Let's just finish this page real quick, and then we'll, then we'll cut it off. I didn't think it was possible to get finished that quickly. Uh, so that's basically a text type. Because what would happen is when people in Alexandria, Egypt, or in Egypt would begin to copy manuscripts, they would introduce mistakes that stayed with them. The people up in Caesarea, Byzantine, or whatever, they would not know that that particular mistake was there. Even the people in Egypt didn't know the mistake was there, because when they made a copy a few years later, they just copied what was in front of them. So what happened is the types of mistakes that were found in copies of ancient manuscripts of the New Testament, they, that particular mis mistake tended to stay in that geographical region. And some in Egypt, some in Caesarea, some in Byzantine, some in Western. Those titles were all invented in the 1800s, and some even later, uh, you know, the, the uh, Egyptian and, or the Alexandrian, Caesarean, Western, etc. However, today the geographical title is not so important, but it is important that you kind of get the idea of that because that kind of gives you a help to get a handle over what these text types mean. Now, real brief, briefly, the Alexandrian text uh, is of the Greek New Testament is that based on some of the oldest manuscripts. It's a critical text. Uh, similar to the West Cotton Hort text and the basis of most modern translations. In fact, all, almost all modern translations except New King James are from this text. 
Now, the next three words are synonyms, Byzantine text, traditional text, majority text. They're a little bit different, but basically they are synonyms. A Byzantine text, also traditional text, majority text. The text or a text type, text family of the Greek New Testament that was common in the East, especially spread by the Greek Orthodox or Greek-speaking uh, church. Okay, and we'll talk more about that, quite a bit more about that. Traditional text, basically the same thing. It was more of a title that was used in the 1800s and even in the 1900s, uh, at the end of the 1800s, and even today somewhat. Usually traditional text means the majority text. Some people use it for the text of receptors. We'll explain why that shouldn't be done a little later. And majority text is the vast number of the New Testament Greek manuscripts. This text is also called the Byzantine text, uh, Byzantine text type, traditional text. But there is a little bit different. We'll talk about those as we go through. If we use majority text in italics, that usually refers to the Hodges and Farstad Greek New Testament according to the majority text. Actually, it was Kurt, Kurt Allen that invented the term, if you were, coined the term uh, majority text. But uh, Hodges picked up on it a little bit later. And then Textus Receptus is a basically a printed Greek New Testament. The Textus Receptus itself has no textual value because it's only a printed Greek New Testament from the 1500s. It's not a manuscript. You hear people talk about the Textus Receptus manuscript. All that shows that they know even less about this than I do. So they know very, very little. <laughs> okay. Okay, now... Uh, but it's a printed Greek New Testament, kind of like Erasmus popularized when he published his New Testament in 1516. Uh, and really, even though the term was invented in 1633 for the Elzevir second edition of the, New, of the Greek New Testament, it really applies to all of those. Uh, any Greek New Testament published or printed and published in the first three centuries of printing. Then the Latin Vulgate is the translation of the Old Testament and the New Testament in about 400 A.D. And, of course, Masoretic text is the commonly accepted Hebrew Bible that was put together from about A.D. 500 to about A.D. 1000. Okay, I guess I'm already out of time. I thought I was allowed to go longer than this, but maybe not. Uh, let's see, do, do we have questions or comments on anything we've covered so far? Now, I paid Dan Ingram to ask a question, but he hasn't got his hand up yet. <laughs> I mean, it couldn't have been that simple. <laughs> Surely someone has a question. Any questions? Okay, what we'll do is we'll stop there. Next time we'll pick up uh, with page number eight. Uh, Robbie had mentioned that I've almost finished with a book on this called The Making and Preservation of the Bible. I do only have a few copies of that left. If you're interested, buy him one. $30, $27 if you're a Chafer Seminary student. By the way, it cost me over $27. Uh, and this next page is page number eight is a uh, the book is four, 500 pages, but that page 8 is a one-page summary of that book, okay? So be reading that page 8 ahead of time. Okay, I guess that's, our session is over then, because she kept going like this. Do we pray at the end, or do we eat, or what do we do now? <laughs> what do we do? Don't record that part. <laughs> he just said to get up here and talk. He didn't say when to stop. Okay, here's the boss. What she says we will do. I don't get paid for this, by the way. Are they paid you? No, well, they're going to. They haven't yet. Uh, we have a break until 10 minutes after 3, and uh, once you just going to close this little word of prayer. Okay, okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your love and grace to us. Uh, all of us here know what it is to experience the wonderful grace of Jesus, and we are grateful for that. We also are thankful for you uh, in your grace, how you give us your word and how you give us opportunity to not only learn it, but to spread it to other folks around Houston and around the world. And we also thank you for providing food for our daily bodies, safety in our travels. And we pray that what we do and say and think today would be pleasing to you. And we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. I mean. <laughs>